Hello everyone and welcome to the Before You Fly Check the Map uh, webinar series. Today we are having part three of the ABCs of National Airspace Types webinars and we're talking about restricted airspaces. Um, my name is Erica Cooley. I am head of uh, community here at Aloft. I'm also a fellow Part 107 remote pilot since 2017. And really here at Aloft, I am focused on connecting with our community, uh, each of you individually, as well as a group to uh, discuss uh, ways that we can provide educational opportunities like these webinars uh, to help you leverage UAS technology to fly safe and compliantly in the national airspace system. Um, today, I'm very excited to be joined by Sebastian Yanguas. He is um, an air traffic control specialist with the FAA. He's also a certified flight instructor and has been flying since 2011 and has been part of the FAA since 2018. Uh, he was active duty in the Air Force and is now a DC National Air National Guard um, for the past 15 years, as well as he received his Bachelor of Science uh, from Emory Riddle Aeronautical University in Aeronautics. So thank you for joining me today, Sebastian. My pleasure. Awesome. So diving right into our topic for the day, um, we are going to be talking about identifying restricted airspaces in the national airspace system. Um, so everyone will be receiving um, a copy of this deck afterwards if you'd like to read through any of these slides. Um, but just a brief overview of what restricted airspaces are, um, and you can read this more in this slide, is really any areas um, of the national airspace system that have been designated where it's just determined necessary to confine or segregate um, active areas that are considered hazardous or dangerous for non-participating aircrafts. Uh, so some examples of these would be artillery firing, um, aerial gunnery, guided missiles. And as you can see in this um, screenshot here, which is from Before You Fly, um, this area is a DOD NSERF, which we'll get into more detail, but it is indicated red on the map. You'll see that restricted operations uh, bar there on the right, which is on desktop, or if you're looking on mobile um, at a restricted um, airspace uh, notification, you'll see that on the bottom of the airspace advisory bar. Um, and some of these um, airspace advisories, which I've kind of already mentioned, would be uh, DOD, DOE, and DOI, NSERFs, national parks, active TFRs, NOTAMs, um, and the like. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Sebastian to really start diving in to some of the specific types of um, uh, restricted airspace. Okay, thank you, Erica. All right, so now let's talk about the National Security UES flight restrictions, also known as ANSORS, for uh, critical infrastructure. So uh, drones are prohibited from flying over designated national security sensitive facilities. Um, ANSORS cover sensitive security locations, usually belonging to the Department of Energy or Department of Defense. Uh, operations are prohibited from the ground up to 400 feet above ground level and apply to all types and purposes of UAS flight operations. Um, certain, certain critical infrastructure area, areas, such as the nuclear power plants, are restricted for drone operations. And below you can see uh, there's a screenshot of an example of a Department of Energy answer for a Hanford nuclear power plant in uh, Yakima, Washington. Okay, next slide. So now let's talk about uh, another type of answer applies for uh, military bases and is designated as a Department of Defense for, uh, for military bases designated as Department of Defense facilities. Uh, below is a screenshot of the DOD NSERF surrounding Camp uh, Bullis DOD Joint Base in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, this is a DOD facility making drone operations anywhere in the area seen in red on the map prohibited. A next slide, please. Now the last answer, uh, the final type of answer is for national landmarks like Statue of Liberty, uh, Hoover Dam and Mount Ra Rushmore. Uh, below is a screenshot of the DOI or Department of Interior answer surrounding Mount Rushmore. 
as, as you can see, Mount Rushmore falls under the Department of Interior and Surf, restricting drones from operating anywhere in the red area surrounding the monuments. And let's go to the next slide. Back to you, Erica. Awesome. Yeah. So as um, as Sebastian touched upon uh, here in regards to um, national monuments, we also have, um, you know, a lot of national parks in our country, um, memorials, wilderness areas and preserves. And um, many of those you will see are indicated in red on the Before You Fly map as well. Um, so as of 2014, national parks were classified as a no drone zone. Uh, so this means that flying um, in the national parks uh, can be stiff fines, penalties, and um, it's important to note that there isn't a FAA um, airspace uh, restriction for national parks. It's actually a ground rule. So the um, National Parks uh, Service and, um, excuse me, uh, national parks are regulated by the National Park Service, as well as the Bureau of Land Management. And there are takeoff and landing restrictions in national parks, um, memorials and wilderness areas and preserves that make it so you're not allowed to operate a drone there after uh, 2014. Um, to mention, there are some national forests and some um, Bureau of Land Management lands that aren't designated as wilderness. Uh, we had a whole webinar that we hosted earlier this year that were pertaining specifically to uh, national parks and operations of drones. So if you'd like to check that out, um, when you receive this deck, there's a link uh, where you can watch that webinar, um, which was also a member of the FAA who joined us for that, as well as read uh, the blog. So that one's kind of nuanced, um, but it was important to mention as it is indicated as red as a restricted operations area on um, the before you fly map. So if you see that, just remembering, you know, you can think of it like, you could take off from a drone, you know, um, you know, outside of a national park, but flying over it would be, you know, breaking the rule of, you know, operating in the area. And a lot of them are, um, a lot of those areas have, you know, wildlife and different um, animals that live in the area that, you know, flying a drone could be disruptive to them. So just wanting to be respectful of that as well as following the rule for national parks and operations of drones in them. So now I will hand it back to Sebastian to talk about uh, TFRs. Okay, so TFRs, they are temporary flight restrictions. So TFRs define a certain area of airspace where air travel is limited because of there's different reasons like temporary hazardous conditions such as wildfire, hurricanes, or chemical spills. Also a security related e events such as the United Nations General Assembly or other special situations like VIP movements. On the advisory card for the TFR, you can click the link text to read the text of the actual TFR containing all the details about the restrictions. And that includes uh, the size, the altitude, the time period of the TFR and what type of operations are restricted and permitted. In the, in the screenshot, um, uh, there is a special security TFR for San Angelo, Texas. Um, okay, uh, move on, moving on to the uh, last one. So lastly, let's talk about the special flight rules area, which is also known as the SFRA or CIFRA. So here in the National Capital Region is governed by a special flight rules area within a 30 mile radius of Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, which uh, restricts all flights in the greater DC area. The SF SFRA is divided into a 15 mile radius inner ring and a 30 mile radius outer ring. Uh, flying and unmanned aircraft within the 15 mile radius inner ring is prohibited without special FAA authorizations. Uh, experience part 107 and public aircraft operators with justification can file a request through the online airspace access program, AAP. A TSA FAA waiver and a special governmental interest or certificate of authorization is required. And flying a drone for recreational or non-recreational use between 
15 and 30 miles from Washington, D.C. is allowed under these operating conditions, such as aircraft must be must weigh less than 55 pounds, including any equipment, if you have cameras or anything else. Aircraft must be registered and marked, uh, has to fly below 400 feet, uh, fly with within visual line of sight, flying in clear weather conditions, and never ever fly near other aircraft. Uh, the airspace around uh, Washington DC is more restricted than any other part of the country. Uh, rules put in place after 9-11 attacks establish national defense airspace over the area and limit aircraft operations to those with an FAA and TSA authorizations. And violators uh, could face stiff fines and also criminal penalties. Great. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for walking us through uh, many of the different types of restricted uh, airspaces that we see on the Before You Fly map and how they pertain to drone operations. Um, now we are going to open up for our live Q&A and um, even maybe demo some on the Before You Fly platform pertaining to certain questions that we've received. Um, a lot of gratitude to our audience for submitting some great questions ahead of time. So we're really looking forward to talking with you all live now. Uh, so the first question that we received uh, is from John uh, G. And the question was actually on the uh, series that we're doing the before you fly, uh, check the map ABCs of the national airspace types. So his inquiry was that this is part three on restricted airspace and uh, that there were two other parts before this. So I'll put a link in the chat um, to the first two uh, webinars that we hosted uh, with Kevin Morris from the FAA. And those were on controlled airspace and special use airspace. And then today we talked about restricted airspace. So if anyone would like to check those out, uh, they're welcome to, uh, we have a blog uh, on each of those uh, different uh, airspaces as well as the recording of the webinar. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, so our first question that I'll pitch over to Sebastian is uh, from Thomas L. And the question is, do approved lands requests get shared with air traffic in the area? Okay, hey, thank you, Thomas, for uh, sharing that question. And the answer is yes. So all uh, lands authorizations are actually visible to or to um, air traffic managers. Awesome. Yeah, it's. I think it's a really um, important point for you know drone operators to know. Yes, indeed, that is why the lands um, authorization system exists because it does let the air traffic controllers um, at the tower that is in that controlled airspace know that there will be drone operations there. Um, so this one kind of piggybacks off that first question, um, and this question comes from Joel P. Or excuse me, uh, Donald E. And uh, the question is, how many days before my event should I apply for a lands authorization? All right. Um, basically, the short answer is as soon as you can. Uh, but basically, we recommend you to apply for approval as soon as you know when you're going to fly. And uh, you can request an authorization through uh, lands, lands up to 90 days ahead of your operation. Um, now, however, airspace is very dynamic. So you must always check notams before you fly in uh, before you fly in case there are any new restrictions that were not uh, in effect when you requested the airspace access. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely that practice of you know checking as far in advance as you can and then submitting those authorizations um, as far in advance that you can before your operation is definitely going to be a benefit. Uh, for you as the operator. Um, so coming into our next question uh, from Joel P. Uh, the question is, do TFRs show up in a loft if I request a lands authorization in a TFR airspace? So uh, this is a great question. Um, TFRs are always going to um, be present on the aloft platform as well as before you fly. Um, I'll share my screen here to show you um, a upcoming TFR that is actually in the Philadelphia area. And we'll look at um, how that looks. Um, when the TFR is active and then beforehand as well. But um, so here, let me share my screen real quick. Oh, 
So here we are looking at, and I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, here we're looking at the Philadelphia area, as I mentioned, and we can see that um, there is a red circle um, that's encasing that area where our pin is dropped. If we come over here on the right um, hand side, there is a um, upcoming TFR, so it says starts in two days, and this is a presidential TFR, uh, which is one that Sebastian mentioned um, in his presentation. Um, and we can see that this is shown as caution instead of being read as restricted because the TFR hasn't started yet. So that's just something uh, good to note is the start and end times and whether those will impact your operations. Um, but in terms of the system, like actually to you know specifically answer um, your question, Joel, in order the system won't specifically block you from applying for a lance authorization when there is a TFR in effect. So you just have to make sure that you're checking those. And if your operations were to take place during that window of time um, that there's a temporary flight restriction, you would not be able to operate. So that's just, um, you know, kind of the intricacies of um, checking those TFRs is also really um, important practice to check you know even if you've checked beforehand maybe a day or two checking you know right before you take off if something new has been added um like the one we just looked at that one's for um you know vip movement presidential um a presidential tfr so those are really important to follow as well Alrighty. So moving on to our next question, which came from Maisie F. Um, to fly into multiple grids with different alt altitudes, do I need a lance authorization for each grid? And I'll uh, send this one over to Sebastian. Okay. Great questions. So uh, in theory, no. Uh, you only need uh, one authorization. But now imagine that you want to fly in four different grids and three of them have a, a maximum altitude of 400 feet and one has a maximum altitude of 250 feet. If you plan to fly at or, above or below 250 feet in all grids, the system will recognize that and provide you with a one airspace authorization. Now with the same example, uh, it'll get a little tricky or a little complicated if you want to fly above 250 feet in one or more of those grids. Uh, the FAA requires you to get an authorization for further coordination in the 250 foot grid cell. Uh, Erica, can you tell us um, what, what a user will experience in the example when they use a loft? Yeah, and this is a really great question. We have, um... We have received it many times and we'll, um, we have another question coming up that dabbles a little bit in more in depth into further coordination requests. But um, in our last webinar, uh, this question was asked and I started looking at the uh, Seattle area, which actually close to where I, um, I live. And so I'm gonna share my screen real quick and show you that on um, actually on the air control. Um, so a lot of, air control platform um, that is, and that is in Seattle. So now that we're looking um, at the air control platform and the just to mention uh, the difference between air control and before you fly, um, before you fly is purely for situational awareness. Um, as some of you may know, air control is our platform that um, is used for uh, lance authorization so you can apply for lance directly through um, the aloft air control platform but what's a little bit different here is you'll see that there's grids all in these different airspaces so the reason why i wanted to look at this airspace um it's very interesting because you have we have three different types of controlled airspace we're looking at here we have two different types of class d airspace so we have boeing field and renton municipal so you'll see boeing field up here on the top um, rent and municipal here on the right. And then this um, class D airspace down here on the bottom is our um, SeaTac International Air Airport. So all of these different airspace circles actually do overlap. But if we um, zoom in a little bit, so let's just choose a spot. Like, let's say, you know, our operation is going to be near SeaTac Airport, but it's here in this 50 foot grid. Um, you'll see it's indicated here with a 
50, you'll see the number 50 written in this block here. Um, but as Sebastian mentioned, that let's say you need to operate up to 250 feet integral for your operations, then you would use the further coordination um, system to apply for that higher altitude than the, auto, the automated um, authorization is set for that grid. So. Um, I'll get to some of the details on further coordination um, here just in a few moments on our um, follow-up questions. But I just wanted to show this area here in Seattle, and there are you know, many different areas that you'll see this uh, across the map. But in general, if you need immediate auto authorization, you'll have to adhere to the maximum altitude for the exact location that you're at. And it will also tell you this in the Before You Fly app. Um, it'll just show you here on in the card that looks the same um, on the right-hand side on desktop. And then um, on mobile, it'll be a, a card on the bottom of the screen. I will show you auto approval available up to 50 feet. And you can see here, further coordination available up to 450 feet. So it's going to automatically give you the information that pertains to the exact location. Same if you were to put in um, an exact you know, um, address, anything like that. Uh, wherever your pin is dropped and wherever the shape of your polygon is drawn when you're applying for your lands authorization, it will let you know that um, with, you know, when you start applying. So for example, like if I click get lands here in our system, um, it's gonna pull up this map here and uh, we can draw out our polygon to be exactly the area that we need. So you'll see what's interesting here is this is actually, you know, an example of overlapping the 400 foot grid and the 50 foot grid, um, but, and maybe a little bit of the corner actually of the 250 now that I look closely, but if we, you know, need to be, you know, in a smaller area, we can move that in, but whatever the shape of your polygon and the area that it encases, it's gonna take the um, the lowest altitude for that grid. So it would be 50 feet, even if it's half and half, you know, on, um, on your uh, polygon shape, so you click OK, and then you'll see here if we click that um, the height option, we click 50 feet, it'll say eligible for auto approval up to 50 feet. But if we click an option that is higher than that 50 foot grid, we'll get um, that eligible for further coordination, which you can easily do through the um, system. And we have a, a few tutorial videos that um, I can share in the chat that walk you through how to do that. So. That was kind of the long answer for that, but I wanted to share, um, you know, how that looks in the platform. So um, now I will move on over to our next question, yes, which is about further coordination. So um, this question came from uh, Nathan H. And the question is, what if a request is not answered um, for further coordination? I've specifically applied for numerous um, further coordination authorizations and haven't received a response in time. So this is a great question, Nathan. Um, I'm happy to um, you know, shed some light on it. So um, we actually here at Aloft recently uh, released a case study that I'll put in the um, I'll put in the chat, which actually talks about um, some of the airports in the country which currently have a 0% response rate uh, for further coordination requests. So this is a manual system. Um, one thing that's really great about Lance, um, as many of you have experienced, I'm sure, is the auto approval, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, auto approval for those max ceiling heights, which is nearly instantaneous, giving you access to fly in controlled airspace. Um, when you need to fly above that um, maximum ceiling height, the process is not automatic. It does have to go through manual review from the air traffic controllers at the specific um, <clears throat> airport that you're applying to fly in uh, their controlled airspace. So, you know, some of those are very busy air airports and um, we do have a, there's a rule that if a further coordination request is not uh, responded to by, um, by ATC at um, that airport within 24 hours of your intended start time, then that authorization is canceled. Um, so I'm gonna pop in the chat the um, blog if you'd like to check that out. There's also an interactive map that shows some of those airports 
um, that are ha do have a 0% response rate. Um, but my recommendation would be is if you don't receive a response and um, you have recurrent operations, as you, um, as you mentioned, Nathan, um, that take place in the same controlled airspace and you always need to fly higher than that maximum altitude for auto approval, um, I would recommend using the FAA's uh, drone zone to potentially apply for a wide area airspace authorization. Um, we have some tutorial videos um, on our YouTube channel if you'd like to um, watch some of those. The, the drone zone is a really great resource that the FAA offers um, that, you know, if there's anything that can't be, um, can't be used in the land system, then that's a great um, option, especially if you have reoccurring operations there. So that is, um, yeah, that is my recommendation for further coordination uh, requests. And then also I will put a link to a recent blog if anybody's interested in learning more about how to apply for further coordination requests on um, the mobile or the desktop version of a loft air control. I just, you know, started showing a little bit um, in the demo there on the previous question. But if anybody would like to uh, check that out, they can um, watch those videos and read that blog as well. All righty, and getting uh, close here to the end of our Q&A, so many great questions, but I have one more question that I wanted to uh, send over to Sebastian. And the question is, what are restrictions for flying on school grounds, not near the buildings? And this came from Stefan L. Okay, um, so basically the FAA is in charge of uh, managing our airspace to ensure safety and efficiency. So uh, many local governments have additional rules about where you can and cannot take off or land your drone. Uh, in addition to checking the airspace for restrictions, it's uh, always a good idea to be aware of any local regulations as well. So regardless where you choose to fly, we recommend to be a good aviation neighbor and always consider all your, um, all your surroundings. Absolutely. And, you know, those are, um, th that's kind of a, a good general rule to follow. Um, there was uh, some questions in the chat here um, that pertaining to national parks. And like, you know, we touched on it a little bit in our presentation, but I think it's great to mention, um, you know, a lot of these rules, their takeoff and landing restrictions for taking off from the ground, right? So the airspace isn't necessarily prohibited by the FAA. It's, there's not a restriction there, but there are reasons why, um, you know, these different governing bodies, whether they're parks and recreations or, you know, um, Bureau of Land Management, things like that, um, why, or, you know, a school, why they wouldn't want a drone operating there. It could be a distraction. It could be, you know, a potential danger to wildlife. Um, so yeah, just, you know, focusing on being a good neighbor um, to, you know, all the people that are in the surrounding area. Um, so uh, pertaining just to one question too in the chat, uh, so to confirm, yes, um, if you're in a national parks area and you bring that up on the before you fly map, it will show you that you're in a restricted area. So that is a rule that came into place um, by the Bureau of Land Management in 2014 to prohibit operations from national parks. Um, so this could, this wouldn't reflect necessarily in the schools, um, like Sebastian was speaking in the before you fly app, but it would be very smart if you did have an operation. And one time I, um, was working for a roofer and I needed to take pictures of the roof of a school and I made um, I made organization with the school's uh, principal to come during you know non-operational times for the school there wouldn't be anybody there and you know it wouldn't be a distraction so just you know using using um, some good communication skills when you're in areas that there might be um, might the draw might be allowed but you know inquiring with those who maybe manage the facility beforehand. And so this leads really nicely into our last question um, that came from Scott G, which is, can state parks restrict drone operations much like federal parks do? Um, so the answer is yes. There are uh, takeoff and landing rules that pertain to state parks, local parks, 
um, and uh, city parks that uh, some are reflected in the Before You Fly um, application and in a loft. Um, it's good to mention the data that you see in Before You Fly and um, a loft, almost all of it comes directly from the FAA, from the um, from their UAS facility map. So those are all the regulations that the FAA has on airspace um, in the national airspace system. But um, recently we did launch um, here at Aloft the Geo Portal Initiative, which is a way for other organizations that you know maybe have takeoff and landing rules, um, things like uh, stadium managers who need to submit, you know, that there's a you know an active uh, sporting event happening at a stadium to give um, operators as much information as possible as to what is actually going on in the airspace and how it may impact a drone operator. Um, so I just wanted to also point out, I'm going to pull up uh, one more time uh, before you fly, and I'm going to show the San Francisco area because this is a great example of a partnership that uh, we had with the city of San Francisco to actually show all of the parks in the San Francisco area and that there are takeoff and landing restrictions for drone operations at all San Francisco parks. So um, as you can see here, um, we're looking at the Sigmund Stern uh, Recreation Grove, and this falls under a regional park in San Francisco. So there are rules against operating drones in local parks, so takeoff and landing restrictions. Um, you'll see this is actually indicated as yellow, but if you read um, the card here, it, it gives you a bit more information saying, indeed, uh, drone operations are not permitted um, at these parks. Um, so you can see information like this uh, throughout the country, but by no means are all state and local parks uh, reflected on the Before You Fly map. That's something we're always working towards adding data um, into the map to just continue making it more and more accurate for our, um, for our community. And um, uh, something that is interesting is that most uh, parks and recreations websites uh, for you know the state or for cities, you can look up like um, drone drone rules and then like the city name, and oftentimes find that on their parks and recreation website, uh, just as another resource for you to check out. So with that, I think that we have come to the end of our Q&A. We've received so many great questions. Um, some of the questions that came into the chat um, that currently I we do not have the answers to are about uh, restrictions for tribal lands. That is a very interesting question. I really appreciate um, you guys sharing that. That is something that I will look into and maybe Sebastian and I can uh, look into and share the answer uh, in a follow-up. I think, you know, there are always so many interesting questions that come through and we just maybe don't quite have time to answer them in this webinar or they could be their own webinar. Um, one of the questions uh, or one of the topics that we're very interested in potentially having uh, some discussion on in the new year is about towered airports and when they close and how the um, how their airspace type changes and how that might impact drone operators. So always love our community's questions, really great engagement. Um, just so everyone knows, this whole session has been recorded. So um, a recording of this webinar will be shared uh, following in an email with you all to watch on demand at any time that you would like. Um, but with that, I just want to Give a big thank you to Sebastian for your time. Uh, is there any any closing closing words you'd like to leave us with, Sebastian? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here, and uh, and thank you for all the participants for asking those questions. That that really means that that you guys care about this community. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. It is always so um, it's always so great to see how engaged the community is asking really uh, poignant questions. And I, I feel like I always learn so much um, during these webinars, even if it's just like and I want to come back and know the answer to for next time. 
So thank you again, Sebastian, and thank you, everybody. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week and look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.